So let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to all of those who, uh, who have joined us. My name is Miranda Swanson. I'm our Associate Dean for Student Services here in the College of Engineering. Um, one housekeeping note before uh, I introduce our Dean. Um, this uh, webinar is geared towards parent of uh, parents of current students, so I just wanted to make that clear. If you have a student who is matriculating next fall, you're more than welcome to listen in. But it's important to note that this webinar is not going to contain new parent or orientation information. So if you are a new parent, you're free to hang out and listen to us. But you um, could also, if you choose to log off and join us, as we will have several webinars this summer that engineering advising will hold for new students and their families. So let's get going. Um, next slide, please. I am now very pleased to introduce Lyndon Archer, our Joseph Silbert Dean of Engineering, uh, who is going to give our welcome today. All right, so thank you, Miranda, and good afternoon and welcome everybody. As you've heard, I'm Lyndon Archer, Dean of the College of Engineering. I am so pleased that all of you can join us here today for this event. Now, I look forward to um, updating you a little bit about our programs, plans, and challenges in the college, and hopefully uh, with my colleagues here to help answer some of your questions. In fact, the many thoughtful questions you submitted ahead of today's meeting. Now, several of you have perhaps already heard me speak about Cornell from the perspective of a proud parent and as a faculty member. Today, I want to briefly speak, um, not in those contexts, but about the progress we've made and are making in the college that I think will improve the quality of the learning experience we're able to offer to all Cornell engineering students. Investments in faculty whose expertise span our programs, persons who are already enhancing the intellectual breadth and depth of research scholarship and teaching in the college. Investments in people, programs and infrastructure that I believe will allow us to accommodate more students who want access to the range of learning experiences we're able to offer in and outside the classroom. I'm speaking here about student project teams such as the rocketry team featured here, undergraduate research, maker spaces and design projects, the engineering leadership program, and many, many more that you'll hear about from our panelists today. Now, let me say a little bit more about the strategy that we developed over the last couple of years that guides these investments. And next slide, please. Now, while I know we communicated many things to you during the past couple of years, I suspect that most of you are not aware that a college underwent a visioning and strategic planning exercise in 2020 and 2021. The resulting 10-year plan, which we've named Cornell Engineering 2030, is published on the college's website. I, in fact, invite you to review it when time permits. Today, however, I would like to just highlight a few key components of that plan to help set the stage for the discussion to follow. First, it includes an updated vision and mission for our college, as well as an articulation of what we value, excellence, purpose, innovation, community, and collaboration. My colleagues who you'll hear from shortly will tell you that these are more than words to our college. They are in fact principles we use to set priorities, make decisions about resource allocation, and are already using to recognize the accomplishments of our staff and faculty in the college. And next slide, please. Our vision, like the any person founding creed of the university, is to provide a world-class education that combines in-class instruction with experiential learning to a student body that reflects the full diversity of our society. I would in fact argue further that considering that many of the biggest challenges of our time in climate and energy transitions, precision medicine, human health will require fresh approaches from a range of perspectives. Therefore, we endeavor to build a collaborative community of people able to leverage the intellectual diversity of Cornell to develop innovative solutions that address these very specific challenges. Next slide, please. 
Now you're here, you're here today that four key commitments guide the work we do in the college. In fact, all the work we do in the college. First, we are committed to providing students with a broad and exceptional education. Second, we are committed to developing creative leaders and citizens capable of thriving in an increasingly complex world. We are likewise committed to leading responsively and creatively in the discovery of new knowledge. And finally, we are committed to creating a better future for all people. Next slide, please. Now we're about one year into the implementation phase of the 2030 engineering college plan and have already started making the investments to ensure that even as enrollments increase, the quality of the engineering education we provide remains without equal. Now, given that our time today is somewhat limited, allow me to share our progress in just one of the four priority education directions that underpin the plan namely fostering a culture that promotes and supports excellence in teaching and advising. I am pleased, for example, to share that in fall 2022, we welcomed 11 new faculty members to the college. While their fields of study run the range from analyzing financial risk to understanding and controlling quantum materials, these new faculty share a common commitment to leading edge research and teaching. We're in fact already leveraging a unique set of resources available through the college's McCormick Family Teaching Excellence Institute to provide tools for these persons to pursue innovative teaching, teaching that moves well beyond the simple transfer of knowledge from teacher to student, and which instead focuses on implementing strategies that enhance student learning. I'm likewise very pleased to share that we welcome the college's first tenure track discipline-based engineering education researcher, Professor Allison Godwin. Professor Godwin's research on developing innovative teaching strategies for enhancing student learning in engineering is crucial to the future of the college. Now, finally, I'm very pleased to report that construction has started on our Thurston Hall update and expansion project. This 47 million investment will approximately double the size of the oldest building on the engineering quad, Thurston Hall. It will provide much needed teaching, laboratory, studio, and research spaces for students in multiple engineering departments, including our youngest, the Meinick School of Biomedical Engineering. Now, when completed in the summer of 2024, the new building will not only give the south end of the engineering quad a modern new look, but will provide additional meeting and collaboration space for all engineering students. So I look forward to the hour we are going to spend together today. I now want to turn things back to uh, Miranda Swanson, Associate Dean for Student Services, who will introduce our panelists. Miranda. Thank you, Lyndon, for that big picture context. Uh, next slide, please. So I am so pleased to introduce our presenters for today, and they will also form our panel for the Q&A. Um, Next, we'll, we will hear from Ellen Zender, our Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies, as well as a professor in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. We'll hear from Lisa Schneider-Bentley, our Director of Engineering Learning Initiatives. We'll hear from Lauren Stolges, our Swanson Director of Student Project Teams, and Melissa Baisley, our Associate Director for the Engineering Career Center. So next slide, please. And now I'll turn it over to Professor Zender. Great, thank you, Miranda, for the introduction. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about the first item in uh, Dean Archer's discussion of the priority undergraduate education directions, but my colleagues will talk about the second item in terms of experiential learning. So first, I'd just like to say I'm really happy to be able to spend some time uh, this afternoon talk about what we're doing to support outstanding instruction in the College of Engineering. And uh, next slide, please. I'll just start with this. That's not me in the picture, by the way. I don't know who that is. I'll just start with saying that teaching accents really a win-win-win uh, situation. So for students, you know, we have better instruction to improve the engagement. Students are happier, have improved learning outcomes. For faculty, we really care about our subjects. We want our students to learn. If you're teaching well, it's a heck of a lot more fun than when it's not going well and you have to patch up a lot of problems. For the college, better teaching. We're going to improve the learning, better professional success. 
And uh, it's really going to help us with the kind of virtuous cycle of being able to attract top students uh, to Cornell. I think one of the secret sauces of Cornell engineering is the great quality of the students uh, that we have and that what that enables us to do. Um, so in a moment, I'll talk about the support that we provide for teaching excellence, but I thought I might just start with the story of the bad old days. So for myself and many of my generation, when we joined uh, the faculty, the extent of our teaching was basically watching what our professors did and emulating them. When I joined many years ago, I was put in front of a big sophomore class in mechanics uh, for mechanical and civil engineers. One of my senior colleagues, very dear uh, Don Conway, shared his notes, he shared his approach with me. But that was about it for mentoring and training as, a, as an instructor. And the semester bumped along, definitely got through it, but not without some bruises. And really poor enough student evaluations that I thought, boy, did I make the right choice here or not? But if you do something enough and you learn from your mistakes, you get better. And I did. But that was a long process and really not a fun process. It's one that we hope to uh, speed up and to be able to exceed what people have seen from their own professors by intentional mentoring and training. So um, next slide, please. For our new faculty, we provide a, um, a two-day workshop for them. Actually, for all of our new and current faculty, we provide a lot of opportunities for the new faculty. There's a two-day workshop when they join, talking about topics like what is good teaching, how to give effective lectures, how to manage your classrooms, what are good practices for grading and assessment, how to make use of the ever-changing technology, such as chat GPT. And I'll tell you a little secret. If you were in a group of professors, or maybe anybody, you want to derail the conversation, just mention chat GPT and everybody will go in lots of different directions. But and I'll mention active learning a couple more times. What is active learning and how do you incorporate it into different types of classes? And basically, active learning is any instructional method that engages students beyond listening and passive note taking. These new faculty workshops themselves model active learning by having the, in, the participants workshop what they're doing, talk to each other, give mock sessions to each other. And we found that it's been effective. Our new faculty tend to do pretty well in their initial uh, course assessments, even though they may be teaching for the very first time. Next slide. For our current faculty, we have introduced uh, last fall, and we'll repeat this next fall, a teaching day covering topics of interest, such as the syllabi, course policies, helping students reset their study strategies after the COVID shutdown. We've really seen uh, the importance of that. Teamwork, more active learning. We also provide weekly teaching tips to everybody via email and they're documented on our website. So getting a good start in the first day of classes. How do you link the exam to the course learning outcomes? How can you increase engagement in the class using polling? And how do you review at the end of the semester as students are getting ready for exams and of course, they get pretty stressed out about the exams. In addition to these group activities, uh, the director of our McCormick Teaching Excellence Institute, Dr. Kathy Dimidek, does a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching with faculty. So you want to improve your teaching, you want to make a change to your course, then she will be able to meet with you and uh, kind of help coach you through that. Uh, feedback is also really important for getting better. So we perform mid-semester evaluations that provide formative assessment to the faculty member. It doesn't go to the department chair. It doesn't go to the dean or to me. It's really just for the instructor to improve upon. And again, if they would like, they can meet with uh, somebody from the Teaching Excellence Institute and get some coaching to talk through the comments and try to find one or two things in a semester that you can improve that would uh, improve your teaching. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also have some support for redesign of our core required courses, and the goal there is to increase the use of known pedagogies that we know work to increase engagement and learning. So far, we've done five courses in MECI, materials, earth and atmospheric science, biomedical, and electrical engineering, and we have been funding two more this summer. We have the RFP out for that right now. And we found that all the courses who took advantage of this uh, redesign support have added active learning, which we know is a significant, we know that it works basically, there's significant evidence that this improves student learning outcomes. 
Next slide. In addition to what we're doing at the college level, the university has supported uh, this active learning initiative. I was part of one of those grants in mechanical engineering. And what we did in my class is we developed a series of exercises that we can use during the lecture in which students get together in groups and they work on small design or analysis questions uh, that then they turn in as part of the homework. Uh, so they get some practice and sort of more open-ended work. They get to work with each other. Um, and the other thing that we did at the Active Learning Initiative is we developed a lot of polling questions so to break up the lecture. So the way this works would be like, you're in a classroom, I could ask a question like, hey, everybody, we just calculated the safety factor and some piping is really large. Why do you think you would design piping with such a conservative uh, safety factor? And students could, through their smartphones, type in answers, they would appear on a screen, and then students can up and down vote which ones they think are the most relevant and important. And we can have a conversation about that uh, and then move on to the next topic. Breaks, breaks the uh, day up, the, the 50 minutes up a little bit. So out, next slide, please. Outstanding teaching requires good classrooms, the right classrooms, the right technology. We have recently converted one of our fixed uh, lecture style rooms into an active learning classroom. And the way these rooms, there's a picture of one there. They typically, it's like circular or small square tables. Students can join in groups. Many of them have projection and whiteboard capabilities uh, associated with the tables. So it's kind of like a you know cocktail hour or something like that, but no drinks, people just focusing on their work. And we filled up all the active learning classrooms. So we're this summer taking one of our other lecture rooms and converting it into an active learning classroom to support that. We have also uh, committed quite a bit of support to keep the room technology up to, up to date and also to convert some of our rooms to support distance learning, which is really important for our Masters of Engineering program where they're doing courses which have students in person live, students remote live, and also students who are remote but taking the course asynchronously. So we have to be able to record effectively there. And that's really uh, driven by our a master of engineering program. So uh, I think I'll just wrap up here. I'd just like to, uh, next slide, if you will. This is really an ongoing effort. I think we'll never be done with this, uh, really involving the university, the college, our departments, our faculty are very engaged in this, our students and our uh, supporters. So we expect the landscape of instruction will keep evolving and our students definitely are evolving. and come to us with different skills and backgrounds than they did a few decades ago. And uh, we will keep up with that in the college. So thank you for that. And with that, let me pass the baton to Dr. Lisa Schneider-Bentley, who's director of our engineering learning initiatives. Thank you, Alan, and hello, everyone. So I'll be sharing with you today about our undergraduate research grants program and how students can get involved in research here at Cornell. So going to the next slide, first I'll give a brief overview of the pro programs we administer through engineering learning initiatives. You can see our four central programs there. All are focused on enhancing and supporting students' learning. In three of these programs, the teaching assistant development, academic excellence workshops, and our tutors on call programs, we're working with student educators to prepare them to create learning spaces that engage and support students as they work to strengthen their understandings of their course material. On the other hand, our undergraduate research grants program is supporting students to apply their classroom learning to the process of discovering new knowledge. So before I jump into that, let's go to the next slide. Um, I wanna show you the rest of our engineering learning initiatives team, that's ELI for short. So there is, in addition to myself, Celia Evans, Brian Sove, and Liz Walton. And you can see that we bring varied backgrounds from sociology to ecology, to education, to finance and management. Um, and truly our greatest strength is our shared dedication to continually grow and improve on what we're doing. So we can be as effective as possible at supporting students learning and development and ultimately their success. So now going to the next slide, I wanna focus on our undergraduate research grants program. So through this, 
we are facilitating opportunities for students to participate in faculty mentored research projects. And the mentoring piece of this is so key. This is an apprenticeship model for learning the academic research process. Sometimes the mentoring is happening as part of a large research team with many mentors and layers. While sometimes a student may be working very closely one-on-one -on -one with a faculty mentor. And students are contributing across many types of research just represented in these photos. We can see research on soft robotics, semiconductor materials, water safety, and that is just a small sampling. Going to the next slide. So from many studies conducted over the years, we know that participation in undergraduate research positively impacts students in multiple ways. Some students may not be the top performers when it comes to classroom learning and test taking, but really get ignited with hands-on engagement in research and discovery and thrive in that environment. So creativity, problem solving, teamwork skills, including accountability to their teammates, motivation, preparation, and, and inspiration to continue. And there is variation in terms of the length and depth of experience that students are having. So some students will try research for a term or two and get some exposure and learning, while others really dive in. They might dedicate a large portion of their time and come out with relatively deep expertise in the areas of a project they focus on. So these students might also be coming away with co-authored publications, great letters of recommendation for graduate school or jobs, and even the initial stages of a pathway for graduate study and research careers. So in addition to the immediate benefits we think about for participants, undergraduate research helps to cultivate our future faculty as well as our future research and development leaders across industrial sectors. On the next slide, I'm gonna show a few testimonials from recent engineering seniors from various majors. And I'm just gonna read some excerpts from this, not all of it, but from the top, I was always a good student with good grades, but I was kind of afraid of the idea of doing research. I felt it would expose my unoriginality. I'm a lot more confident in my decision to pursue a PhD now. And then next, undergraduate research has strengthened my belief that affordable access to safe drinking water is a fundamental right and has furthered my interest in pursuing a career in environmental engineering. And finally, research needs tremendous patience and consistency in the face of multiple failures and ambiguity. Although this may sound exhausting, the process is actually very fun and satisfying once you have a supportive mentor and colleagues. That was my case. I am pretty excited for it. So these are so powerful to realize these impacts in students' own words. Going on to the next slide, this brings us back to just how does our grant program work? So students typically apply for funding to support their wages and sometimes for a small additional amount to support the expenses of their research. So especially for students who must earn to support their educational costs, they can do that while also having an extremely enriching educational experience rather than just taking a summer job or a campus job. Going on to the next, which is perhaps the most immediate question, is how can students find a research opportunity? And the answer is by exploring and connecting. So from simply exploring faculty research pages online, students can get a sense of the abundance of amazing work that is happening and see what sparks their interest. They should also talk with as many people as possible, ask questions, share their interests, ask for advice. Besides being the best way to make connections, these are also valuable networking skills for students to practice. A great resource on campus that students can access is CURB, the Cornell Undergraduate Research Board. Students can join the CURB listserv to hear about events. They can even join CURB's mentoring program to get connected with a peer mentor who can be a role model and guide as they navigate the terrain of getting started in research. When students do start reaching out to faculty members to ask about research opportunities, they should be persistent to find the best match for themselves. Finally, to the next slide, 
I just want to finish by saying there are so many opportunities for students to get involved and to apply and extend their classroom learning while here at Cornell Engineering. I'm not suggesting that undergraduate research is the best route for every single student. However, for many who do engage in research as an undergraduate, the experience is transformative and really defining and clarifying for their future directions. It's so exciting to witness students becoming inspired and motivated and also equipped to advance knowledge and make a difference in the world. Thank you. I will end with my piece there and um, turn it over next to Lauren Stolges, our engineering projects team director. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lisa, and welcome everyone. I'm excited to spend part of the day with you, um, telling you a little bit more about the engineering project teams program. Next slide, please. So as you've heard from some of my colleagues already, um, and if you've looked through the strategic plan, the College of Engineering is committed to making experiential learning opportunities very integrated throughout a student's um, career here at Cornell um, and to offering a varied and impactful opportunities for students to, to get hands-on experience. And student project teams are one unique way to do that, where students are working together on multidisciplinary teams to solve pretty complex problems. So currently this year, there are right around 1,400 students uh, from across all 14 engineering majors and from all seven of Cornell's undergraduate colleges and programs that participate on project teams. This program is unique in the way that it integrates with the academic curriculum. The real world lessons that the students are learning through their hands-on project work are solidified through a framework for critical reflection and are acknowledged with course credit. Next slide, please. So there are currently 34 project teams in the program, ranging from design and build teams to teams focused on social impact and app and web development. Each team is divided into several, or in some cases, many sub teams. So beyond sharpening their technical skills, students are gaining experience and expertise in things like business, design, marketing, fundraising, operations and logistics. And truthfully, I could spend the rest of the day and beyond um, talking about uh, all of the students that are part of this program and, and all the work that they're doing. But for purposes of today webinar, today's webinar, I thought it would be really fun to highlight three teams, um, each doing really different types of work, um, and tell you a little bit more about their work um, in, in just a bit of more detail so that you can get a flavor for what's going on. So on the First slide, on the next slide, um, I'm gonna tell you about the Cornell Rocketry team. So this is one of our design build teams and it's typically the type of team that people think about first when you say project teams. Design build teams like Rocketry go through a novel design and build process each academic year. So in the fall, they're usually working on onboarding and training new members and design for their project. They're doing manufacturing and fabrication in the winter and the spring along with testing. And then typically they're validating their final um, project by participating in a competition. And in the case of Cornell Rocketry, the team goes to compete in the annual Spaceport America Cup, which is an international intercollegiate rocket competition that's held each summer in New Mexico. So this cycle exposes students to the full product life cycle and allows them to develop hands-on technical expertise that really complements and augments their classroom studies. Participating in a competition forces the team to push their creativity and innovation with realistic constraints about the design and the budget and other factors that are put in place by the competition requirements. So the rocketry team is comprised of subteams that are based around critical components of the rockets. So they have subteams that focus on structures, propulsion, recovery and payload, electrical, embedded software, and then they have a business subteam that handles finances, sponsorship, logistics, um, and more kind of on the administrative side. This team has a lot of fun together, as you can see from the pictures that I've included on this slide. Their project is actually one of the most technically and administratively challenging in the program. And as a group, they tackle those challenges 
and also strive to build a strong community that celebrates and supports each other. The team also supports a number of activities and initiatives that focus on the involvement of women in STEM. You can see the women in STEM at Cornell little icon that they've developed um, and they've held events and, and even fundraisers um, to kind of rally around that particular topic. I've included a brief video. We'll see if we can get it to work so that you can get a flavor of the team's, um, the team's efforts. This video is from their first successful static fire test of the year, which was completed earlier this month. Um, and we'll see if we can get that to play. If not, I will make sure that I share the YouTube link with you. Um, but basically, they put just the end of their rocket upside down in a safely identified location with all the procedures outlined um, to test their uh, propulsion capabilities. Um, and the rocketry team is even more unique because they are making their own propellant. So that but you heard me right, we have students creating rocket fuel here. Um, and this static fire test is really the last big milestone before a full test launch, which is scheduled for later this month. So I might have to just share the YouTube link, which I can put in the chat once I'm done chatting, because I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, to highlight a team um, that is our Cornell chapter of Engineers Without Borders. So, um, like I said, they're a chapter of the National Engineers Without Borders USA organization, and they work on community engaged projects uh, locally. So here in Tompkins County, uh, domestically and other locations within the United States, and then also internationally. This team uh, sounds a lot different than the rocketry team, and you're right, they have a very different um, focus and, and a little bit of a different organization structure. Um, the team organizes itself around four key values, global awareness, compassion, collaboration, and technical expertise. Um, and they're currently working on projects in Sanuka, Tanzania, on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, and locally with Sustainable Tompkins, uh, a local nonprofit organization. The team is also pursuing a digital agriculture project and has a business sub team that focuses on raising funds for both their domestic and their international projects. Um, there is a video link on this slide as well that I was not going to play because it's um, a little bit longer, uh, too long for today's purposes. It runs about five and a half minutes, but again, I'll share that link um, in, in the chat with some other uh, resources after I'm done chatting. Um, we had several members of the team and actually two of their advisors who were able to travel over winter break this year to the community in Sanuka, Tanzania, where they've been working with a local nonprofit as well as the community water board to implement the pilot phase of a solar powered irrigation system. This project has been ongoing since 2018 uh, with many delays due to COVID. And so this trip was a huge milestone for the team. And they created a beautiful video journal to document their trip. And that's what this link will, will bring you to. Uh, five and a half minutes, it's a little bit long by today's social media standards, but it, you, trust me, it'll be worth your time. It'll put a smile on your face um, and it'll give you great insight into the impact that projects like this are having in communities around the world and just the variety of different types of um, experience that students can get uh, through project team participation. So on the next slide, the third team that I wanna to highlight today is Cornell App Dev. And this team focuses on developing apps as you might have guessed from their name. But one thing that makes this team really special and unique is they develop apps specifically for the Cornell community. So the team is organized into sub teams uh, focused on product design and then iOS, Android and backend development and marketing. Um, and members from each sub team are grouped into pods to work on a specific project. Um, and if you have experience um, with software companies or in the kind of software realm, this structure might sound familiar to you. Um, the teams based uh, their structure on an industry standard type of organization. So it gives students a really excellent experience um, working uh, in a professional environment that many of them will choose to go into. Another thing that makes this team unique is their focus on education. Um, with the guidance and oversight of some of our excellent CIS faculty, students on AppDev offer a number of student-led industry-level courses in digital production, um, development, um, 
And these are project-based courses that serve as an excellent introduction to these skills. So they have a much broader impact than the students who are just on their teams. And beyond all of this, the biggest thing that stands out about this team is their commitment to creating a tight-knit, inclusive community. So the quote at the top here um, is from the team's homepage and it pretty much sums up their ethos that they love apps and each other too. So in closing, um, we'll go to the last slide. I just want to share that there's many ways that you and your students can learn more. Um, this will take you to our website. We have a fun Instagram page to follow along with. Um, and we have a wonderful, accessible, dedicated team of staff available to answer questions at this shared email that's on here. So I have really enjoyed spending some time with you. And I am going to turn things over to Melissa Baisley uh, from our Engineering Career Center. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Um, today, I'm going to talk about key resources uh, that the Engineering Career Center offers. Uh, first, uh, next slide. Uh, first, I want to mention that the, this is the model that we use for working with Cornell students in their career development. Um, we help students at any phase of this model think about um, learning more about themselves, understanding themselves, exploring their options, and taking action in uh, their career development and job search. Our office works specifically uh, with students from first year um, all the way through PhD students on everything from exploring major options um, to developing resumes and application materials to negotiating job offers. Uh, we encourage students to meet with us early. Uh, first year is not too early to come and learn about the resources and start taking advantage of different options here uh, at the university. Um, and the other thing I would mention is many, if not all, first year students have met with us in the Engineering 1050 class um, that is taken in the fall semester. So can we, next slide, please. So the key resources, I'll share links to these um, after I'm done speaking, uh, as Lauren is. Um, the first key resource I wanna talk about is the Cornell Outcomes Dashboard. Um, very frequently we are asked, this is definitely a frequently asked question, where do Cornell students go? Where do students from this major or that major go? How much money do they make? What companies are they working? At what industries are they working in? All this data is available in the Cornell Outcomes Dashboard. It's public avail publicly available. Um, and we graduate, we survey graduating students each year and ask them, where are you going? And you know, for the data that then goes into the dashboard. Um, for the class of 22, which we just finished surveying. 97% um, of engineering students who responded to the survey indicated they secured what we call the first destination within six months of graduation. 40% uh, of the class of 22 is attending graduate or professional school, and 57% is um, employed. So more specifics, um, can be, you can discover more specifics by filtering the various uh, criteria that are important to you in the Cornell Outcomes Dashboard. And like I said, I'll share that link in a minute. The Another great resource that you should know about, please encourage your students to use, is the Career Development Toolkit on Canvas. Canvas is our learning management system. And within it, Cornell Career Services has the Career Development Toolkit, which consists of, you know, close to 30, if not more, various modules. And they can be on everything from, you know, how to put together a resume, how to interview, technical interviews, um, to things that are more specific. Like what does a career in software engineering look like? What is a user experience role like? So there's a lot of content in there. And uh, it's definitely something that we encourage students to use. And we hope that you encourage your students to use as well. Another resource, you know, actually another frequently asked question we get is where, where can I find jobs? Where do employers who want to hire Cornell students post jobs? These are posted um, in Cornell Handshake. Jobs and internships are posted in, posted in there. Um, but Handshake has many other features. So for example, if students are looking for workshops related to career development, those are in there. If they're looking for other events such as like a coffee chat with an employer 
or uh, a um, information session with an employer. Those are posted as events in, in Handshake. Career fairs are posted in Handshake, and there are multiple career fairs um, offered annually. So Handshake has a lot more than just jobs and internships in it. The other thing that's important to know about Handshake, and I would just say you might want to mention this to your student as well, is that students can follow employers of interest. So for example, if a student is interested in Johnson & Johnson, they can follow J&J &J in Handshake. And then when J&J &J has activities or information sessions on campus, they'll get notified about that. The other key thing is that students need to um, often check their notifications in Handshake. Some people feel like they get too many notifications or not enough, just like all the apps that we all have that's a part of managing that. Um, so Handshake has lots of information and resources in it. Very useful. A, third, a fourth resource that's super helpful for students is our Engineering 2350 Career Development course. This course is really great for students who need some structure. You know, as we talk about the career development model, we step students through the, uh, through the model. We do exercises related to learning about yourself, exploring your options, taking action. And it's a great way for students who need structure or who are struggling with managing, um, taking care of some of these things outside of the classroom. It's a way to, you know, have this integrated into their curriculum. And then the last resource I'm going to talk about today is CU eLinks. CU eLinks is a platform for networking with Cornell alumni. These are all alums who've opted in and said, hey, yes, I'd like to help share a perspective on my career in you know, software engineering or you know, whatever. So, or you know, students can search by major, they can search by location, they can search by you know, various clubs that they've participated in to find alumni um, who have kind of similar backgrounds as theirs. Um, this is a great resource. It's not the only way students can connect with alums on campus, but it is um, one of many tools that are available. So. These are the kind of the top five that I wanted to mention today, and I'll hand it over to Miranda now. Thank you so much to each of our presenters. Um, now we are going to turn off the slides uh, and spend a little bit of time in Q&A. We had a lot of questions sent in ahead of time um, and we're able to take a look at those and see especially which ones were asked by many people. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time really uh, trying to answer some of those frequently asked questions and uh, we'll start with Alan. Great, uh, thank you. Well, uh, this also came in during the chat of the uh, meeting and a couple of people wrote in something along the lines of, you know, in some classes, students get 50% and that's an average grade. And, you know, why are you doing this? And why is it that you're weeding out uh, students? And of course that puts a lot of stress on students. So first I'll say, you know, that's definitely not our goal to have exams where the average is 50%. And, um, you know, that basically is a test of all the stuff that you don't know rather than trying to have a test of what you do know. I could write an exam for myself that I would get 50% on because, what I don't know in mechanics is way more than what I do know. Uh, so, so I'm sure that happens. It's not our ideal. And we will, if I knew a little more about which specific courses that was, uh, we could, we could uh, address that with the faculty members. In terms of, you know, are we trying to weed students out? Definitely not. And of course, it won't feel like that if you're one of the students who's failing a course. But I did, in pre preparation for today, I looked at some of the uh, grades in our gateway courses like chemistry, math, physics, intro to engineering. And typically we have anywhere from zero to three to 5% of uh, students who would earn a D, F or W. So that would, would have to retake the course. So if you're one of those three to 5%, it's no comfort to you, but we definitely strive to, uh, to support those students who are doing poorly through academic excellence workshops and run out of Lisa's team. Uh, through advising, uh, lots of office hours that uh, we offer. That's one of the most fun parts about my own teaching is doing office hours. Um, 
And if students need to retake a course, there's some scholarship money available to catch up in calculus, for example, in the summer. And I wanted to mention that last summer, for the first time, we offered a free online calculus preparation course for entering first year students. That seemed to be pretty effective. And we're looking forward to doing that for the uh, class that enters in fall 2023 as well. Thanks, Alan. I'll now turn it to Lisa. Okay, thank you. So um, the question I've received is, what kinds of summer research opportunities are available for students? Um, and I'll say that staying over the summer to do research on campus with a faculty mentor here at Cornell is a really wonderful opportunity for a student to have concentrated time with the project and really make progress on that, as opposed to during the semester when they're juggling their coursework and everything else. And our grant program can help um, support students to be able to do that. At the same time, there are also many other possibilities students can explore for opportunities to engage in research at other campuses all over the country. The National Science Foundation supports hundreds of REU programs at campuses all over the country, and REU stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates, and other organizations as well, such as the NIH and NASA, sponsor similar programs. So for those Successful applicants can receive generous stipends and living support to spend the summer engaging in research um, at, on, at other campuses or research centers. And for these, students should really start exploring possibilities, say November, December, to be ready for application deadlines that typically fall in January and February. We, um, on our program web pages, we list and link to these types of programs to help students see uh, all the various types of possibilities available to them. Thank you, Lisa. Lauren, you got a lot of questions about project teams. So we'll turn it over to you. I did get a lot of questions. I love, I love that there's so much interest and so many questions about project teams. So the the many questions that we got about project teams, um, a lot of them focused in on the fact that project team spots are limited. Um, and the questions were around whether the number of spots or teams were going to be increased, um, and then also how else students can get hands-on experiences. So I really want to um, take just a minute to try and address uh, both of those. Um, so the first one, uh, increasing opportunities for experiential learning for students is part of our strategic plan. You heard Dean Archer mention it. You've heard you know, a number of my colleagues talk about it. You heard Alan talk about um, and some of the active learning initiatives. Um, and so part of this includes growing the project teams program as well as increasing other opportunities, um, both curricular and co-curricular for students to gain that really valuable hands-on and, and team-based experience. Um, so as far as project teams go, um, we actually have had a lot of growth uh, since I arrived. So I started right at the beginning of the 2019 fall semester. Um, and when I started, there were 27 teams and around 1,100 student participants. Um, and this year, uh, I think I said this stat in my little part of the presentation, we've got 34 teams um, and just over 1,400 students that are participating. And so the goal is to make sure there's growth that is um, sustainable uh, and that ensures that everyone who's participating still gets a really valuable experience. And so this includes working with the individual teams um, for them to adapt and grow um, where and when possible, and also includes adding new teams to the program. Um, I also want to point out that you know the system is quite dynamic. We have you know students who are joining at multiple points throughout their undergraduate career, um, students who join and then maybe move on to a research opportunity or a, a co-op, um, and so the spots open up as the student participants are changing semester to semester. Um, it's, not a, it's not a static figure, um, semester to semester, year to year. So the second question um, about how else students can get experience is actually something I talk about with current students all the time. So I love to talk about the project teams. Um, I love to talk about this program and the work going on, but I also see it as part of my role to be a resource and be a connector for students to all of the different ways that they can gain this type of experience. Um, and the first thing that I do when I'm talking to students about this, 
um, is really to ask them a lot of questions about what they want out of the experience. Um, you know, things like uh, what sort of technical skills they're interested in. Um, you know, if they're interested in working with a client or a campus or community partner, I've got a whole a whole list of things that I work through to really help them hone in on their why and what they're really looking for. And then think about, you know, project teams might be a, a great opportunity for that, but what are some other resources and some other things on campus, um, both within the college and across campus that are available. So I, I curate a whole list of those things um, and I shared some of these um, with Miranda ahead of time so that she could put them in the chat for you all. Um, while I'm just mentioning some of them. So the College of Engineering website does have a page where we highlight some of the many experiential learning opportunities for students. This includes project teams. It also includes things like our engineering leadership program, um, information for engineering students interested in studying abroad and more. Um, also within the college, our diversity programs and engineering page um, highlights DPE affiliated organizations where those are great opportunities for students to get that leadership and teamwork experience. Um, and Bauer CIS also maintains a list of CIS focused clubs and organizations. There are also lots of fantastic hands on opportunities associated with specific labs or departments within engineering um, that aren't necessarily part of the project teams um, program. So a couple examples there, um, Mason Peck's Space Systems Design Studio is a really awesome experience for a whole number of students. Um, and uh, something like the Cornell Cup Robotics team, which is advised by Dave Schneider out of Systems Engineering, we work closely with those students um, you know, and partner with them on some things. They're not actually kind of a part of this project team's program. And there's lots of um, opportunities like that that, again, I'll try and refer students to. Um, I want to leave time for other questions, but I have some other links um, to put in the chat outside of engineering, and these include things like the Experience Cornell website, um, looking to our partners like the Einhorn Center and Cornell Campus Groups, which is out of student and campus life, um, which all have, you know, lots of resources, lots of opportunities for students to, again, get that hands-on team-based experience that's so valuable. Um, so. Miranda, I'm happy to help you put that laundry list in the chat, sure. but I, I really it's want the parents to have it um, and always want the students to have, you know, know how many options there are here. So I think our last uh, questions is going to be directed to Melissa, because I think the one uh, office that had as many questions as project teams was our career center. So a question that comes up a lot this time of year, uh, particularly with first year students is how worried should I be if I'm a first year student and I don't have an internship? And you know, the first thing to know is employers do not expect engineering students to have internships related to engineering the summer after the first year of college. Um, you haven't had fluid mechanics, you haven't had system dynamics. You know, there's, there's a lot of coursework you have to complete uh, before you can be super um, capable and competent in an engineering internship. So what we encourage students, particularly the summer after freshman year, to do is think about what skills and competencies do they want to develop, right? And they could be doing this through independent projects. It could be through volunteer work. All engineering students have access to, actually all Cornell students have that free access through to LinkedIn learning. There's a lot of skill development that they can gain there. Um, but you know the, the things that employers look for in sophomores, for example, when they're interviewing them are initiative, adapt, uh, adaptability, problem solving. Have they gotten involved outside of the classroom? Um, but probably more than anything else, they're looking for a willingness to learn and an enthusiasm for what the company does. And that really comes through when the students have researched what the company does. Um, and as you know, obvious as that may sound, it's it's not always um, something students think about is, is important. Like you have to be into what that company is into. Um, so this is something that we talk a lot with students about, and if you, I know we're short on time, so I will say, um, please send students to us. Uh, we can talk to them about 
all the various ways they can be developing their skills and their competencies, as well as developing career knowledge of industries and roles this summer. And I'll hand it back over to Miranda. And we are out of time. So uh, before we log off, grab any links that you might want out of the chat. Um, I've just put the strategic plan link in the chat and uh, did want to let you all know that this uh, recording will be posted online, probably give us about a week. Uh, but I'm going to put that as our very last link in the chat for you all. And just a, a, a thank you to all of you for joining us and a huge thank you to all of my colleagues uh, for presenting uh, to you today. Take care, everyone.